Welcome back. You're watching Citizen Business Centre. And as we did say at the beginning of the bulletin, we are unpacking the numbers of the Economic Survey Report 2016. And we're asking the question, is it just a rosy picture? Is it, was it a chance for the government to pat itself on the back? And is it a true reflection of what Kenyans are actually feeling? We've got an all-woman panel tonight. I'd like to introduce my guests, and that's where... She's a development economist, uh, Phyllis Wakiaga, the CEO of Kenya Association of Manufacturers, and Liz Nkuku, the Chief Investment Officer at Cyton Investments. Ladies, thank you so much for joining us um, tonight. First, I'd like to get a pulse of where you stand in as far as the report goes. What, what stood out for you and the with you? Well, as a development economist, yes, the GDP grew by 5.6%, but so is our population about just under a million people were born last year which means when you look at the ability of gdp to translate to poverty alleviation because our population is growing so quickly it's having a negative impact on the capacity or the ability of economic growth to actually alleviate poverty so for me as a development economist i without as a main figure i looked at the gdp per capita mm -hmm. that's important because we'll also be looking at the trickle down when do kenyans that's really right. begin to feel um you know the the impact of gdp phyllis what stood out for you as a manufacturer, we, of course, yes. you were one of the yes. key performers in this particular report. What stood out for you? For me, what stood out for me is, first of all, that the economy is growing at 5.6%. Between 2010 and 2015, the Kenyan economy, in terms of the sub-Saharan economies, has grown averagely at 6%. Sub-Saharan economies have grown at 4.4%. So it means we're actually growing as an economy. For the manufacturing sector, 10.3%. Last year was 10%. That's a marginal growth. Uh, the growth was about 3.5% increase, the previous year 3.2. In 2013, it was a 5.4% increase in the growth of the manufacturing sector. Mm -hmm. For us to be able to achieve Vision 2030 and all the growth we inspire for in the manufacturing sector, we are supposed to grow at 10% per annum. We grew at 3.5%. So we have grown, but there's a lot of room for improvement mm. in order for the manufacturing sector to grow significantly mm. and lead to job creation. And lead to what uh, Anzetsi is saying, that we need to see this transforming the lives of Kenyans. Can the growth result in transformation of lives, creation of high productive jobs, and issues that actually drive the day-to-day -day lives of our Manainchi? All right, Liz, what stood out for you in the report? Um, as an investment manager, I think 5.6% growth is really good. And uh, given what happened in the global markets last year, I think we, we are in a region whereby, or in a country whereby we can proudly say, yes, we are growing. 5.6% is good. I know, again, the growth in, the, in, um, in population is also a good thing for us. Because what that means is that we can consume. As, you, as much as we can consume, so our, our economy continues to do well. Mm -hmm. So for me, if I look at it, it's a, a really good positive indicator, 5.6, um, compared to the globe whereby everybody is by, grew by about 3%. In Africa, I think the growth is about 3.4. So I think we have a lot to be grateful about. 5.6 was good. All right, let's talk about um, you know, the impact to Kenyans. And one of the things that stood out, I think on social media, everybody was talking about it, and that's the average salary of uh, Kenyans, which is now standing at just over 50,000 shillings. What do you read into that? Well, I think an important story that this uh, economic survey pointed out is that in terms of job creation, again, the informal economy is really dominating that space. Now, there are a couple of implications in terms of waged employment. When you look at that level of uh, growth in informal um, job creation in the informal economy, one is that typically informal economy don't necessarily have to pay the minimum wage um, because they're not necessarily registered. They don't have to do a lot of the contributions such as NHIF, NSSF. They don't really need to contribute to pension funds. Medical insurance isn't an issue. So I think when you look at the pattern of job creation, the fact that the informal economy preponderates really warrants uh, scrutiny of the informal sector to make it a poverty alleviation uh, mechanism or machine. Mm -hmm. um, right now, the, 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 the focus on wage jobs being in the formal economy is clearly um, not enough are being generated in, in that part of the economy. So I think really the story for me also in this economic survey is let's, let's look at the informal economy and let's make it as effective and efficient as possible. And that does not necessarily mean formalization mm -hmm. because uh, the informal economy has yet to be, a case has yet to be made for them to enter the tax net, which is really what they, the, what they see. I'll formalize and then I'll be taxed. Mm -hmm. And then I'll have labor laws to comply with and then I'll have all these things. Mm -hmm. So really I think government and also other stakeholders need to find a way of dealing with that dynamic in the inform informal economy since it's such, since it's such an important uh, job creator. Let's stay with this um, informal economy issue. Uh, and you know, there's 
713,000 jobs created in the informal sector. And my question is, how do we know that these jobs are sustainable? You know, are we going to get 713,000 or more jobs in the 2017 report, for instance? And because this is primarily in the informal sector, how sustainable is that, Phyllis? Um, the jobs created in the informal sector, as has been mentioned, are not that sustainable. They are a good thing, but it's important for us to target job creation in sectors like manufacturing, ICT, and sectors that are very stable, so that we are able to create high productive jobs. The manufacturing sector, for example, creates very high productivity jobs. And if we are able to target growth in that sector so that we have more growth in the manufacturing sector and in effect grow the number of jobs in that sector. Another sector that did well and contributed to this growth was the agricultural sector. We know as a country we are really a primarily agricultural country and a lot of jobs are being created in that sector. But can we improve then the skills in that sector, the productivity in that sector, so that we are creating jobs of high value mm -hmm. and then create the value chains and the linkages with manufacturing and industry so that we are growing the manufacturing sector and exporting more. Mm -hmm. That's where we are building. Uh, skills transfer is, yes. is you know is that being One. taken seriously enough within the manufacturing space what is happening is a lot is being done to try and promote TVET and uh, technical trainings because we've realized that as a country we've concentrated on having most people having white collar jobs or having degrees mm -hmm. but we are not having the right skill set in terms of technical skills if you read the economic update by World Bank they're talking about the fact that we have an educational sector but we're not building the skills required for the job market so what can we do as a country to first of all identify what those skills are in industry we've identified some low-hanging fruits that are required simple things like electricians we don't have an adequate number mm -hmm. plumbers and a number of technical skills so if we can identify those skills and the gaps that exist in the market and have close linkage between academia and industry to ensure that we are building those skills we'll be able to create the kind of productive jobs we require mm -hmm. within the manufacturing sector all right Liz, uh, real estate and I know that is one of your passion topics 7.7 percent um, to GDP in 2015 I, I guess answering many people's questions about is there really a boom is it going to bust at some point what did you read into the figures I think if you look at the figures and uh, the, the construction that have, have been coming up, uh, the, the residential really coming, I think the growth has been steady. So if you look at it, is we already have a deficit in housing in the residential. So what developers are doing are focusing on those areas. So the main question is then what sectors do or what areas do I then look at and do I invest in? And is there uptick? So if I look at all this, um, the employment is going up whether in the formal or informal sector, slightly growth, and I think in the informal sector growing faster. So what that means is there's more demand for real estate because all of us are really looking to invest in uh, or to live uh, in a nice place. Mm -hmm. So for us, when you look at those figures, these residential approvals going up, it's a really good thing for us. Ability of people to, con uh, I think, to buy real estate also increases because if you look at the wage growth, it has been really good. I think it's almost 30%. Mm -hmm. So that means that people can consume, uh, can actually spend more in uh, housing. And if the last time we did our, our report, you'll actually remember we said that people spend up to 40% of their income mm -hmm. on housing. Mm -hmm. So if that is the case and the wage growth is increasing, then the, uh, the real estate sector is bound to do well. Mm -hmm. And we are actually now working on the backlog and then there's still more population coming in, there's more urbanization, yeah. so the opportunities are great. All right. Uh, we're coming to an end, and I want to take your final comments on expectations for, for next year. I mean, the government did achieve, uh, or was well within its uh, predictions of between 5.5% and 6% growth. What are your expectations as we, you know, get into this new phase? I think we need to continue to keep an eye on inflation. It was within the range of the CBK, so that's a good thing. I think another thing we need to keep an eye on is our forex earners. Uh, both tea and coffee production fell last year by quite, quite a bit. Um, and of course, we know that tourism, which is an important for forex earner, continues to decline. It's been a year and year decline. So I think in terms of servicing our foreign denominated debt, we need to have a very robust strategy around ensuring that our forex earners are healthier than, than they have been thus far. I think we need to focus on export competitiveness and growing our exports. We know that exports to some of our traditional markets like ESC and EU declined last year. So we need to look at the issues that plague competitiveness mm -hmm. and be able to grow our markets again. We also need to look at the KITP, the Kenya Industrial Transformation Program, which was launched by the Ministry of Industrialization. It's looking at growing the manufacturing sector to 15% by 2020, meaning in the next four years we need to do big things, focus on certain sectors where we have a competitive advantage 
deal with issues like VAT refunds, the IDS and the issues that affect our day-to-day -day competitiveness so that we can grow our export competitiveness. I believe we can industrialize through trade and if we are focused as a country and we are looking at our exports, we'll be able to grow the manufacturing sector and the manufacturing sector normally has a multiplier effect across all other sectors. All right. Let's, if you look at it, um, we are lucky to be in a region whereby it's growing. We have a diversified economy. We have a lot to do in terms of maybe uh, just making sure that agriculture we add value to it. Mm -hmm. So if you look at it from an investment perspective, I think we are in a region whereby a lot of foreign capital continues to look for a home. Mm -hmm. And given that um, uh, the other uh, countries are not, doing, are not doing that well, so we need to position ourselves as a, as a destination for capital. I think the Capital Markets Authority is really doing a lot of good work in that front. And us as the participants as well, we can really uh, push, push that in and also go and, and picture the countries uh, as an investment destination. So I think a lot really has to, has to go on, but I think the, 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 the footing is right. All right, ladies, thank you so much for joining us on Citizen Business Centre tonight. Liz Mkuku, CIO, uh, Site and Investment, uh, Phyllis Wakiaga, CEO of Kenya Association of Manufacturers, and of course, Mzetsewere, a development economist. Thank you so much for being on the show tonight.